Okay, so uh, welcome back to the uh, last lecture of the quarter, somewhat amazingly. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about adjoints of linear transformations. This is something that we've seen before, okay, in different contexts. So, so if I had a matrix for this linear transformation, it would correspond to taking the transpose in the real case or the conjugate transpose um, in the complex case. What we're going to see today is that um, give kind of a more operator theoretic viewpoint of this. I think it'll be a little bit nicer. Okay, and we've also we'll use this kind of new language that we're using with inner products to reformulate and give more precise um, versions of like things we've seen before, like the rank nullity theorem. Okay, so let's just get going. What do we have? So we're going to start with t from v to w. These are going to be real or um, complex vector spaces, okay, with an inner product. Okay, which I'll all, which, okay, which I'll just assume exists. Um, then the adjoint, okay, so the adjoint of T. So this is a linear transformation going from WV, oops, sorry, W to V satisfies the formula, um, the inner product of T of V with W is equal to the inner product of V with T star of W. Okay, so notice, oh, so, so I should say these are inner products, right? They might not be the same, and so, over here, you're taking the inner product um, in W, and here, you're taking the inner product in V, okay? And this is for all V and V, and for all W and W, okay? So we had essentially, last lecture, I think, seen that this holds for the trans... If we, these were, you say, between, you know, Rn and R to the M, then... If T was represented by a matrix and I took its transpose, this relation would be satisfied. Okay, but now this can just be the definition of this linear transformation. Okay, just it satisfies this formula. Um, and so the first thing to ask though, so is that does this always exist? Okay, so this exists um, by construction. Okay, again, we don't need to take a transpose or anything. This is just. You can just c compute what this has to do based on the above formula. I'll call this star. Um, so what do you have to do? Well, first, uh, by Gram-Schmidt, okay, we can take an orthogonal basis. Ortho or uh, let's just say orthonormal bases. Um, for V and W. Okay, so let me just call this V I and W I. Okay, and I want to define a linear transformation T star. Uh, so what it suffices to do is tell you what the image under T star of a single basis vector is going to be, right? And then I extend by linearity and since the inner product is linear, notice that if I can verify this equation holds for you know every basis vector in V and W respectively, okay, for any basis vector in V, any basis vector in W, then since it's linear, I get it for any vector in V and any vector in W. Okay, just expand the inner product. Okay, so what I really have to tell you is where this goes. Okay, so in other words, Um, I want coordinates um, with respect to V sub K for T of W I. Okay? Well, notice first that coordinates with respect to an orthonormal basis, this just corresponds to taking the inner product. Okay, right, the coordinate of any vector x um, in V 
with respect in this orthonormal basis is just the inner product of, of v, k, and x, okay? And notice we know what this has to be, right? By the above formula. So you just, you know, demand that this is satisfied, okay? T of v, k, w, y. And the key thing is that the, now, I mean, you're starting with this is just a known quantity, right? You know the matrix, or you know the... Uh, linear transformation t, you have this collection of vectors, this set side is totally computable, and then you just set the inner product um, of, or you set the image of uh, wi under t star so that the inner products match. All right, that's it. I mean, that, that, so this is really, a, I said this was the thing that it, the formula that it satisfies, but it's really a constructive formula, okay? And as I said, this is something, if you we're looking at uh, something from Rn to Rm. This would just be the transpose of some matrix, or Cn to Cm, it would be the conjugate transpose. Okay? So what we're going to do now is we can use this um, to reprove or sl slash reframe, or actually give more information, um, about the rank nullity theorem. Okay, so remember, we had originally proved this essentially by doing uh, reduced row operations, right? So you're doing row operations and column operations to compare various dimensions of vector spaces. Um, so here, we can, using the language of inner products, we get a little bit more. So we get that the kernel, oh, sorry, so maybe just go back, I'll say T from v to w is linear transformation, t star is the adjoint, okay? Then the first claim is that the kernel of t star is equal to the image, oh, the orthogonal complement of the image of t, okay? And similarly, if I look at the kernel of t, this is the orthogonal complement of the image of T star. Okay, so maybe, so first notice that, um, you know, since this is similar to if you take the transpose twice of a matrix, you get just get the matrix again. It also follows immediately from the formula above that if you take the adjoint of the adjoint, this is just what you get, that you just get the linear transformation T back, okay? So what this means is that 1 and 2 are equivalent, okay? All that, you know, you just um, plug in what, you know, t star for one and t for the other, okay? So I'll just prove one, okay? Um, so first, maybe I'll just recall, you know, what we have to show. So if you have w contained in V, just recall that the orthogonal complement is the vectors where the inner product of W and V is zero for all W and W, okay? So in other words, the orthogonal complement of a subspace is all vectors which are perpendicular to every single uh, vector in that, in your subspace, all right? Um, it all, it's an easy fact uh, to prove that if you look at the dimension of V, this is the dimension of W plus the dimension of its orthogonal complement. And if you want, you can now use this uh, to reprove rank nullity theorem. Okay, so remember the rank nullity theorem and kind of the variations that on it that we had shown, there you were looking at the kernel of A transpose and versus the image of T or image of A and so on. Um, but you can use this fact and and one or two to you know go through and see what the kernel of T and the image of T have to add up to, and it turns out it's exactly the dimension of V. You can you can essentially just get um, every dimension consequence that we had gotten previously from this fact, 
But now we know more, right? We know that these subspaces are really orthogonal complements, which is kind of nicer. Okay? The other nice thing is now that one is, is very easy to prove. Okay, now that we kind of have the right language to do it in. Um, so what's the proof? We're just going to show double containment. Okay, so first I'll do this way. So take a W in the kernel of the adjoint transformation. All right. Well, this means that, okay, in particular, it's zero. So what does this mean? Well, I know that V, oh, I'll try to, sorry, wrong bracket, T squared W is zero for all V and V. All right, you take the, you know, the inner product of the zero vector, you get zero. Ah, but all of a sudden this is now equal to T of V W, this inner product is zero for all V and V. So therefore W is in the orthogonal complement of its Im of the image of T. All right, we've proven that the inner product of T of V with W is zero for all V. That's exactly being in the orthogonal complement. Okay, and the other way is um, essentially the same level of difficulty. Um, so if um, W is in the orthogonal complement, okay, well, what this means is that we know for all V in V, um, T of V with W is zero. Uh-huh. Again, this implies that for all V in V, V T star, the adjoint of W is equal to zero. And now you just have to show that this implies that W is, that T star of W is equal to zero. And this is true, right? If you take um, a vector where every other vector has zero inner product with it, that means that it had to be zero. In particular, V could have just been, you know, T star of W, and that implies that it would have to be strictly greater than zero if, if, if this was non-zero vector. Okay, so since the inner product with everything is zero, this had to be the zero vector, so W was in the kernel of T star. Okay, and that's it. All right, so somehow um, it tells you more, and it's also a shorter proof. Like, there's really um, nothing nicer. Okay, maybe I'll say this is a coordinate-free proof. And these are generally nicer to work with if you can find them in linear algebra. So what I mean is here, like, we proved something about linear transformations, and we never had to choose a basis for V or W. Okay. So that's kind of nice in the sense that you didn't have to do much computation. Uh, on the other hand, it's kind of a, a higher level of abstraction, right? You're really, you know, you're not doing computations with bases or anything. You're just using this general formula and deriving consequences. So it, it is kind of a more, more abstract proof, okay? But, but I claim better. Um, okay, so I want to give another nice uh, consequence of um, working with these adjoints. Okay, so let me, again, let T from V to W, T to, from W to V, the adjoint. So what we can do now is restrict uh, T, okay, so I want to restrict this um, to the image of T, so I'll just call this the image of T star, and it goes from the image of T star. Okay, so we're restricting to its image. We don't know where it goes, um, but we know that it has to land in the image of T, okay? And now the claim is that actually this is an isomorphism, and even stronger, if I look at uh, T, this is equal to this projection that we defined composed with the orthogonal projection onto the image of T star. Okay, so let me draw a picture to see kind of what this means. So here's T going from V to W. It 
you know, we assume that it has some kernel, okay? I mean, this is also valid if there's no kernel at all, right? In this case, the image of, of T star would just be everything and, and you know, you're not changing uh, T at all, right? The, or the orthogonal projection is just the identity. But in general, um, there's gonna be some kind of non-trivial but not uh, surjective image of T star, okay? So we know the orthogonal complement is the kernel of t. And then um, for any vector v, uh, what we have is that t of v, if I wanted to find t of v, I could just project to the image, orthogonally project uh, to the image of t star. Okay, so this is the projection of v. And the claim is that these go uh, to the same linear transformation, or the same uh, image under t, okay? So these both go to the same vector, okay? So this is kind of most, maybe I'll give you another example which is mo more striking. If I take something like any linear transformation from Rn, or in this case R2 to R, okay? So here I just have zero, one, two, and so on, okay? So <clears throat> what you can imagine is that this transformation is going to have a kernel, okay, of t. Again, um, there's gonna be an image, which somehow, okay, I decided to flip them in the picture. So notice unless the matrix, or unless the transformation t is the zero transformation, This the image of T star will just be a one-dimensional uh, vector space, so a line in your vector space. And what you can think is that these are the vectors where T of V equals zero, and then if you want to figure out the value of any other vector in your vector space, you're really just calculating the distance uh, from this, from this uh, kernel subspace, okay? So in particular, if I was looking at like t of v is k for some k in r, it would just be um, this linear subspace parallel to the kernel, okay? And I can know that because, well, this is precisely, all the vectors here precisely project to the same vector under this linear transformation, and therefore by this claim they go to the same place, okay? So you get this kind of, um, what you might call like a foliation or something, some stratification of these lines where all of these are just the pre-images or these are the, 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 uh, ve the vectors that get sent to various real numbers. Okay, there's a similar picture in higher dimensions, but kind of the picture for R is um, the easiest to see, okay? Um, so let's prove the claim. Okay, so why is this true? So we have to use the fact that it's an adjoint and then we're also going to have to use the fact that it's an orthogonal projection. Okay, so we have that we have, well, we have T of V. Okay, so let me just take V and V. This is equal to T of V minus the projection onto the image of T star of V plus the projection of the image of t star of v. Okay, so then just by linearity we get the first part onto the image of v, okay, plus t on of the projection. Um, and now the claim is that, well, this is zero, okay? So, or that this, this is zero, sorry. So why is this? Well, I know that this is um, orthogonal to the image of T star, right? By construction, right? You're taking a vector minus its orthogonal projection. And by the above fact, we know that this is this, the orthogonal complement, well, I'll just say so it's in the kernel of T, right? Because the kernel of T is precisely, let me pull it back here. The kernel of T is precisely the orthogonal complement of the image of T star, okay? So therefore, once you subtract this, um, you get 
you're going to zero under t, okay? So you just get that t of v is equal to t of the projection onto the image of t star of v. Okay, and that's the proof. Again, it's quite easy once you, you know, have the right language, um, but it's also very powerful, right? So what this means is that if you're interested in understanding v, or sorry, in t, so, you know, t of v is determined uh, by t restricted to this subspace. Okay, everything else you obtain just by orthogonally projecting the subspace and then and then hitting t. All right, and then it turns and then certainly there's no kernel um, of this linear transformation. So, in some sense, you can only deal with vector space isomorphisms, and you're and you're not losing too much information. Okay, so let me um, move on now to uh, specific linear transformations. Okay, which have some nice. Uh, geometric um, importance. So I'm going to be looking at isometries between vector spaces. Okay, so here T, again, it's going to go from V to W. Both of these are going to have inner products. Okay, and it is an isometry. T is an isometry. Um, if the norm of T of V is equal to the norm of V uh, for all V and V. Okay, so it's uh, norm preserving. All right, or it preserves the lengths of, of all vectors. Okay, this is um, some in some sense m most interesting when W is equal to V, but um, you can define it in general. Okay, so here's um, a lemma, which is, again, kind of, if you're going to use matrices and transpose, it's kind of a hassle to write down, but in this case, uh, T is an isometry, okay, if and only if um, T star T is equal to the identity. I'll just emphasize this is on V, okay? So the proof is easy. Um, it's gonna follow just from being an adjoint. Okay, so let's just show this direction first. All right, well, if you wanna show, if you know this, then I can take um, the inner, you know, V and V and look at the inner product with itself, okay? Um, this is going to be equal to the inner product of T star T of V, V, since it's just the identity. And then by the adjoint formula, this is T of V, T of V. Okay, so since the inner products are preserved for vectors, it's um, going to be true for, for the norm as well. Okay. This direction is, is a little more involved. And actually, I'm going to not prove part of one, one statement. Um, it's theorem 6.1 in the book. It, it's a pure computation, um, but uh, I'd prefer just for you to read it. Okay, so what this says is that uh, T is an isometry um, if and only if it preserves the inner products. Okay, so T of X, T of Y is equal to X, Y for all X, Y, and V. Okay, um, so T is an isometry if it preserves, you know, just by the definition, we're saying it, if I look at the inner product of V, V, it's equal to the inner product of T of V, T of V, but now they're saying you can choose two separate vectors, okay? So this, this um, essentially follows from I, I, some identities involving the norm versus the inner products, um, which we had seen before in... Um, some of the previous sections, okay? So now, uh, what do we have? Well, take any, you know, if you know that T is an isometry, then you get that T of X, T of Y, is equal, the inner product of that is equal to the inner product of X, Y. On the other hand, um, this is equal to T star of T, X, Y. 
Okay, and therefore, since x and t star t of x uh, have the same inner product with y um, for all vectors y, this implies that this just has to equal x. Okay, so therefore, it's the identity. Um, so this implies... Um, that isometries are left invertible, okay, and we have a specific inverse. Um, so an, invert, an invertible isometry uh, is called a unitary transformation. Okay. Um, if you want, you know, a good example of something that's an isometry uh, but not unitary, well, you just need, a, a, you know, a nice map which is left invertible but not right invertible. Um, here's one, right? You just send R into R2, right? And just make it the identity on the x-axis. So T goes to T0. Okay? That certainly does it, and there's... A map backwards, the adjoint transformation, which is, you know, in this case, the the adjoint is just projection, um, or you can think of it as projection onto the real line. Okay, so this will be um, an isometry that obviously can't be unitary because these vector spaces are of different dimension. Okay. Okay, so we we can define the same um, thing for matrices. Okay, so we can define, you know. Um, unitary matrices and they're going to satisfy you know the conjugate transpose of u is equal to u conjugate transpose equal to 1 okay um, you can also do this so this is um, from, from CN I mean we're working more generally if you if they have real entries then these are typically called orthogonal matrices. Okay, so this goes from Rn to itself. Okay, and these are precisely the linear transformations which fix the origin and, you know, obviously on Rn and also preserve the Euclidean distance. Okay, so some examples um, that we've seen are you know, something like reflections or rotations in R2, okay, or you can, un or in higher dimensions, okay. You know, and you can check, um, so here there's the matrix cosine theta, sine theta minus sine theta cosine theta. Here, well, I'm not sure what the matrix is, it's similar to 1, 0, 0, minus 1. And in both cases, you can check that these are orthogonal matrices, right? If you take the, uh, the transpose of both cases, you just get the inverse, okay? So a useful um, fact about unitary matrices, okay, and orthogonal matrices, is that the image um, of an orthonormal basis Um, under, you know, a unitary transformation is an orthonormal basis. Okay, so this is all preserved. So in particular, you know, the norms, the lengths of elements of vectors are preserved, so therefore, you know, orthonormal is defined, the inner products are preserved, so the ortho is okay, and of course, since it's invertible, you, you get a basis, okay? So if you're thinking about matrices, you can notice here that if I take any theta, then the vectors cosine theta sine theta and negative sine theta cosine theta form an orthonormal basis for R2, okay? And you would just see that geometrically by the fact that, you know, they take the standard um, orthonormal basis to a rotated one, and that obviously stays orthonormal. Okay. Uh, for non-examples, it's you know any essentially anything that scales is not going to be um, a unitary matrix or an isometry 
um, and also, you know, anything which is distorting angles of any kind, right? So something that sends like one and zero one is certainly not going to be an isometry or unitary. It highly distorts angles and also, and also distorts norms. Okay. Um, some more useful facts. is that, um, as you can guess, since an, this orthonormal basis goes to an orthonormal basis, the determinant uh, is of a unitary transformation is plus or minus one, okay? And also the eigenvalues, or even stronger, I should say, the eigenvalues of u have norm one, okay? Oops, I should call that have lambda equaling one. Okay, so if this is real, of course, in the real case, this is just plus or minus one. Okay, and in the complex case, you might get sent by a complex, you know, it might be an eigenvalue, uh, which is complex, uh, but it'll be on the unit circle in the complex numbers. Okay, so I'll just prove. Um, this part because this, the first one uh, will follow from it. Okay, so notice, of course, I'm just looking at the norm of u sub x. This is equal to uh, the norm of x, okay? But also this is equal to, um, well, if, if you have an eigenvalue, it's lambda x, all right? And this is just by properties of norm, the norm of all right, lambda uh, times the norm of x. Okay, so therefore this has to be one. So, you know, again, you might get in the real case like a minus one or in the complex case, you'll get some, um, you know, e to the i theta. Okay, but you certainly won't scale anything. Okay, so I think that is actually um, all that I had. I think I kind of was skipping around the chapter a little bit. Um, so it's gonna be a shorter lecture video today, but I, I guess I can, um, you know, morally say that that's legitimate by the fact that this is supposed to be a short week. So I'll end just by saying thanks. Well, thanks for listening this quarter.